Hello, it's me again. Uh, feeling a little bored and lonely. I feel like telling a story. Came to mind tonight. I don't know what brought it up. You know, I'm going through quite a lot. With, on top of I've got COVID that I still uh, <clears throat> still am recovering from. I was actually so I'll just leave it at that. That really hangs in there sometimes. And <clears throat> this is a story about when I walked and ran 58 miles home through the rain, cold rain, in October or early November at that, with no jacket and no hat and no cell phone. 58 miles. And there's a little bit of a love story behind this. Um, whatever. I go back to the year when I was 20 years old, 20, and um, You know, I was living up, up near Lake Ontario in um, Sotus, New York. And I had a girlfriend, uh, it was a long distance relationship that I met through my father knew her parents from his work. And uh, I met her, uh, Jenny Lynn, and uh, <clears throat> quite a steamy, I don't know, first love. Uh, I met her when uh, I think I was 17. And this is before cell phones and after smoke signals. So um, that meant we relied a lot upon letters and occasional telephone calls. It was long distance. She lived in upstate, or actually downstate New York in the Catskill Mountains. Um, in a small town called Otego. And we lived up by Lake Ontario in, in Sotus. Both of us living with our parents at the time. And I can't tell a whole story. Um, I just want to talk about this day where I wound up walking, running 58 miles home. <clears throat> Well, one day I got a call, we were talking to her, I don't remember which, and I was invited to come to her place where, at her parents' farm. They had a farm in the Catskills up in the mountains uh, where they were going to build a um, barn. They were going to build it shaker style. Uh, they were going to use no nails at all. Everything was going to be cut, notched out the old-fashioned way, you know. And it was pretty ambitious. And I was told I was welcome to come help out and join in, which sounded great. And uh, there was going to be plenty of beer. Sounded great to me then. You know, I'm, but I'm more or less, it was going to be great to see her. And so I said I'd be there. And it was on a Friday after I got out of work. And I got out of work on a Friday. Didn't even go home, I just got my car and started driving south, you know, south, south, east to the Catskill Mountains. I think it was about a three hour drive, I'm not sure which. And uh, I remember I was really excited. I um, was remember playing the radio, playing uh, Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits was a new song then, pretty fairly new. And that was like my theme song, you know, my driving song, going to go see her. So, <clears throat> I got there, and it wasn't, uh, wasn't, actually, no, it wasn't quite daylight yet, um, or day, nighttime yet. And sure enough, there was a, it was raining, very cold rain, uh, slow drizzle, really. And there was a bunch of guys that I didn't know any of them except her brother. I knew him, Joe, and uh, they were all standing out in the rain, a muddy place where they had these whole bunch of these big timbers uh, laid out for the foundation of this barn they were going to build. Uh, they had a lot of animals, horses and 
livestock. These people were, this is back in the olden days, but they were granola heads, whatever you want to call it. They tried to live off the land, sustainable. Even back then, they made their own soaps, their own cheese and dairy products, you know, butchered their own livestock and poultry and grew their food and so forth. Pretty down to earth people. So all these people are standing around. A lot of them were from the local fire department that chipped in that these people knew. A bunch, a bunch of white, uh, woodsy kind of guys. And uh, I don't know how else to say it. You know, flannel shirt, work boots, ball caps kind of thing, I guess. Jean jacket, beards. So nothing much was getting done. All these guys were just standing around talking about how it should be built. And nobody was actually doing anything, which I thought was funny. Uh, they managed to get the boards laid out on the ground, like the outline of where it would be with, with nothing else. Just a bunch of timbers, like telephone pole sized timbers laid on the ground. And then they made a big mistake in my estimate, then and now. They broke out the beer. They had a couple of kegs of beer. No, 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 no. Everybody knows you don't break out the refreshments till after the work day is done. Not before, definitely not during. And once they opened up the beer, it was all over. Nothing got done. Uh, they talked about it for a little while, then it started raining harder, and we all just went into their farmhouse, which was way out in the boondocks, this muddy plot up in the mountains, really, that's how I remember, it's mud. And it was fall time, there wasn't any green, so it was just kind of shades of gray and shades of mud, and a lot of smoke and hanging in the air from the, they had a fire going, plus they had a fire going in the house. So a very warm atmosphere in the house. We all sat down at a really, really big table and continued to drink. And uh, Jen and her mother started cooking up a storm. They were really, really good cooks. And uh, yeah, that's all it got done. It, everybody kind of passed out right there on the floor or on the couch or in a bedroom. And uh, there was a lot of, there were women there too. And I, this is going to sound awful, but I remember you could hear people all throughout the house, yeah, couples in bed. You could hear everything. And I'm like, oh, man. Like, it's like dueling bed springs going on all around me in this place. I'm sorry, sorry. That's just reality. Well, we got up in the morning and uh, had um, breakfast, I recall, and that was the end of it. Everybody went home. I stayed another day, Saturday, and the weather turned nice, as I recall. And I went horseback riding with Jen, Jenny Lynn, to Georgie, the name. And they had, uh, they made their own snops. The family are German-Italian descendants. And they had an old family recipe, the best schnapps I've ever had. Apple schnapps, they made from scratch. And the mother told me, if you want the recipe for this, you've got to marry my daughter. And I said, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal, you know, at the time. And uh, it never would happen. Distance, distance, distance relationships are tough. Spe always are tough, especially in the days before, you know, the internet. So we had a good day together, her and I, and we had a good night together, her and I, as I recall. Sunday came along too quick, and it's time for me to go back to where I came from. And I was kind of tearful. I remember her. I remember. I still remember it. Is I leaving anything out? No, I was really impressed with these people. Um, like I said, they did everything themselves there, almost everything. And uh, she had a lot of work to do. And uh, everybody on that place had a lot of work to do every day, taking care of the place and the livestock and the horses. 
and they really stro stro strove to live off the land. And they did a pretty good job of it, I might say. So Sunday morning came along, it's time for me to go, party's over. Bar never got built, that's on them. That's what happens, you know, whatever. So I say good my, my goodbyes to Jen, <clears throat> Jenny Lynn. Got my car and started headed back north where I came from, up towards Lake Ontario. And something told me I should have gotten gas, but I didn't listen to that nudging gut instinct. I just kept thinking, well, I'll stop at the next town and get gas. Now, I want to take you back in time to this time was, I don't want to say the year for some reason. I'll just say at this point in time, the gas stations were gas stations. They weren't convenience stores. It was a gas station. They sold gas, diesel, uh, cigarettes, machine, cokes, condoms, combs. You know, they had a garage with a couple of people that would fix your car, fix your tire, and a tow truck to pick you up if you needed it. And they were almost always closed on Sundays. So, come on, puppy. And this was a Sunday. Come on. Man, he's down there going nuts. Sorry. Interrupting this. So I kept driving. I don't know. I got about an hour away from them. And it's about a three-hour drive. I'm, this is estimates. The miles that I walked are not an estimate. That's fact. Well, around about mid-morning Sunday, my car ran out of gas in the middle of nowhere. And all I could do was pull it off to the side of the road. I'm trying to remember what car I had. It seems like I had a, a Pacer or... No, I had a... 1969 Dodge Polaris, which was an old car even that year. It was an old car. I paid $600 for it, but it was in really good shape. It was a 69 Dodge Polaris. Big car. Gas guzzler. Cruiser. Like they all were then. So I pulled over. Not much to do. Get out and start walking. I mean, there weren't any cell phones. I didn't have, there weren't. They didn't exist far as I know. And I figured I could hitchhike. There was hardly any traffic on the road where I was at. It was pretty remote. Like I said, this is Catskills area. This was a long time ago. The population was even less. And Sundays back then were the Lord's Day still, at least in the sense that stores closed, gas stations closed. Almost all, all of them closed. Everything closed on a Sunday. A day of rest, right? People still observed it. And people generally stayed at home and uh, the big event was a family dinner in the evening. That was Sundays in the old days. Not that long ago. Well, I walked and I walked and I walked. And this is about when I'm age 20, 20 years old. I was as tall as I am now, but I had long brown hair and a long beard down to about here. I looked like a hippie. Um, and I, it started raining. And I came, to, I came to see her right from work, which is to say I didn't, have, uh, I didn't have a jacket. I just had my work clothes on. It was a button-up shirt, jeans, and some kind of shoes. I don't know. I didn't even have a hat. I didn't wear a hat back then much because I wasn't bald-headed. I was, had a full head of hair still. Imagine that. I had long, long dark brown hair and it parted in the middle like everybody did back then. And a long beard, like a Jesus look. Called it, some would call it. Um, nobody picked me up. I kept walking and walking and walking. And then it started to rain, so I started jogging a little bit. And I jogged some, and I'd walk and jog and walk. 
and this was this was around I don't know it was probably I think late October early November it was cold and if I wasn't young I probably wouldn't have made it and then the sun set and then it rained more and at this point I'm running quite a bit in my work clothes that are wet and I'm uh, pretty discouraged and every now and then a car would come by just headlights and I'd try to thumb it down and they just whiz by me and get me more soaked with all the rain water they pulled behind them big clown of zoom all this mist and rain would fly all over me and soak me and I started getting angry every time I tried to thumb down a car they just sped by me and I'm like come on back here come on I remember I'd stand out in the middle of the road stop you heartless you stop give me a ride they just kept going nobody picked me up I mean I was a big tall hairy guy soaking wet at nighttime you know I would have given me a ride but somebody like me didn't pass me I remember walking by I think it was around nine I don't know what time it was the evening in the countryside, there's a huge old house, and it was lit up, really weird white light inside. And I just stopped, and I stared from their front yard. I could see the family inside, and there was a large family with a man in a black coat, and a woman, a woman in white dress, and all the children and babies. A large family seated around this table, and I watched them. And the woman, it looked so warm and inviting. And it would turn out it was gaslight. That's why it kind of gave off like a gaslight glow that you don't get from electric lights. And it looked so good, the family scene there. It looked so, it looked like Little House on the Prairie, but they had a lot more kids than that. And uh, I'm like, God, it looks so nice. And it turned out these people were like Amish. I think they were Amish. That's what it was. And they were dressed like from the 1800s, the way they dress. But they were dressed up proper at the table, and the man was sitting at the head with the children on the sides, and the, the wife was serving dinner. And I was thinking, God, what a beautiful sight. And me standing out here in a freezing cold rain at dark. And then their dog picked up on me inside the house and started barking. And then the Amish guy got up, and open the doors and let his dog out onto me. He didn't know who was out there, but he knew someone was. He let his dog out. It was like a big German Shepherd. And I thought that was mean, especially for somebody that's supposed to be a strict follower of God. But I understand he has a wife and kids. You know, you've got to think security. So, and that dog come running after me. I mean, that dog knew exactly where I was at. I was out by the road in the dark. And uh, this, you can think whatever you want. You can think it's horrible, but I picked, I had a big rock. If you ever go walking through the countryside down the road, find yourself at least one good fist-sized rock because people don't chain their dogs up in the countryside and some of them will bite you. No matter what you say or think, some of them will take hold of you and attack you. I've had it happen. So I had a big rock. A rock is a good deterrent. Most dogs don't like to mess with a rock and an angry man. And uh, that dog came at me with an intent. And I threw that rock and hit that dog in the side. And it let out a yelp. And it ran right straight back where it came from. And the Amish guy was in his front door at this point, uh, staring. I don't know if he could see me or not. But his dog came running back to him. And I just stood there like I was angry. I, life at this point and then I just turned and walked off kept walking down the road he probably you know I forgot to mention this I don't know if you ever read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or even seen the movies but I've done both and it was a great novel written by a 19 year old Mary Shelley back around 1800 or so there at that time period that wasn't the year but around then and there's a scene where Frankenstein is the monster he just feels lovesick. He wants somebody to love him, you know? That's the sadness behind it. That's part of the whole, drives the plot, the loneliness of this monster. And nobody, he's just an outcast. 
an ugly, feared, everybody's afraid of him. It drives the whole plot. And I felt like Frankenstein's monster staring in at this picture of tranquil beauty. And the same thing happened with uh, the monster Frankenstein in one of the scenes where he was staring in at uh, some people having a, a nice dinner and stuff. So I remember thinking of that. I felt like Frankenstein. And uh, after that dog got hit, whack, right in the ribs, I don't think I heard it. I really don't. Enough to make it stop coming after me. Hey, I had to. I, that thing would have gotten hold of my leg. I would have been in trouble. You know, especially when I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Right? Do you do what you got to do? So the dog turned around, ran back, and I just stood there like, oh, I was angry. I felt like Frankenstein, ostracized. And the guy went, shut the door and went back in. Who knows, he might have got a gun. They have guns. I know some people that are Mennonites and some Amish, and they do hunt. They're not vegans by a long shot. Now, they raise their own meat or they hunt it, small game. From what I've seen, it's usually kids and teenagers, they go out and they hunt deer or whatever they can get. But they have guns. So I kept going down the road. And I ran. And I walked. And I ran. And nobody would give me a ride. I didn't pass any gas stations or any place with a phone booth. It never occurred to me to knock on somebody's door in the countryside and use their phone to call Maybe my parents were both alive and both drove then. Um, why didn't I do that? I asked myself that. I didn't want to. I, I just didn't feel... I thought it was kind of risky to knock on somebody's door out in these parts at night. You know, no car, nothing, just a stranger out of nowhere. You never know. Somebody could, could uh, kill you. Uh, there, I came to... Around here, I knocked on somebody's door where I used to live five miles out of town. And I was looking for my dog. And come to find out this person had my dog, they found my dog, not the one I have now, the one before this. The guy came to the door with a pistol. You know, talk about paranoid. It's just me. I'm looking for my dog. But the guy came to the door with a, looked like, like a cowboy Colt 45. Wanted to know what I wanted. You know, you don't know what you're going to meet. You knock on somebody's door at night in the countryside. So I kept hoofing it home. I got home uh, where I lived alone. And it must have been about four in the morning the next day, something like that. And I was soaked. And I just went right to bed. And I got up the next day. And uh, sometime in the afternoon, and missed work, obviously. And I went back, I got my mom, I think it was my mom, she gave me a ride to get my car with a can of gas. And it was 58 miles that I covered that night, 58. In the cold rain, with no jacket, no hat. And when I gassed my car up, started right up, of course, and I drove home at that point and checked it again. 58 miles I walked. So that's the story behind that. Um, not much there, but I was just remembering that. I've done a lot of walking in the Army and the infantry. Uh, that's different. We used to go 25 mile road march with a pack and rifle and helmet. Um, but I went 58 miles on this. That's a long ways on one shot with no meal, no nothing. I just I don't know, I felt like telling a story and that one come to mind. I think I was thinking about um, a tragedy of recent that really weighs heavily, extremely heavily on my soul right now, still. My world just got incredibly smaller with Jen's passing three weeks ago and her mother's. My world just became smaller for now. We don't know what God has planned for us. But I was thinking back 
through the years. And uh, it's just things never seem to work out right for me when it comes to romance. And this one that I saw, this this woman, um, we, we, back when I was 20, we both were, no doubt, we were in love with each other, but she drifted apart, didn't, the distance killed it. And I spoke to her about <clears throat> eight years ago, I found her. She lives in Pennsylvania, and uh, she definitely um, remembered me. Oh, she had none of the good things to say about me. Said that every day of her life went by where she regretted that she lost me. Because she did. She wound up seeing somebody else eventually. Huh. Oh well. <laughs> that ain't ever worked out for me. I don't understand it. You know, I had that uh, encounter with God when I was like 11 or 12 where he gave me a choice of two paths. And path one that I sadly rejected, he told me that I could have everything good that this world has to offer to include the love of my life and a long, happy marriage full of love and children where she's in good health, I'm in good health, and our children are in good health. All of our lives and our marriage and our love is blessed. And God told me this, believe it or not. So, and, and other things he told me. So God puts a, a value on a good love. But it wouldn't have any value if it just happened all the time, guaranteed, would it? If it was just guaranteed to everybody that was ever born, ever walked this earth, was going to find the love of their life and live a long, happy marriage and relationship with health and wealth and love as love can be and all that good stuff and, you know, in the favor of the Lord. I sometimes think such a life would cause me to drift away from God. But, you know, I brought that up to God and He said nothing could ever separate me from you. Nothing. Nothing. With a laugh. I'm not going to retell that story. But you know, I, told, I heard God tell me right before I met Jen that just passed away. He said, I've got someone very special for you. That's how he said it. That's how he sounded. And he said some other things that I'm not covering here because it involves somebody else and I don't want to incriminate anybody or upset anybody. But he said, I've got someone very special for you. And then I met Jen two days later. And boom, like fireworks between us, instantly, instantly, big fireworks. But he never said it was going to be an easy ride or an easy walk, or that it was going to last forever, because it wasn't easy, but it was definitely someone very special for me, and her friends her close friends at her funeral thing told me that no doubt about it, I was someone very special for her. She just had a hard head and it just couldn't do. She told me she was no good in relationships when I met her. But love, I'd walk 500 miles to see her again. Better have some good shoes at my age. I would walk 500 miles, but that's not going to happen. All right, I think that's it. What's the farthest you ever walked? Leave it in the comments. Okay, take care. God bless.